Welcome to Let's Get Real. My name's Sue Eldridge and these are my gorgeous friends. I'm Ali Wilson. And I'm Chris Larkin. And I'm Cece Wilson. It's lovely to have you with us today. So, I don't know if you've seen many of, of the other programmes that we've done, but, but on many of them we've talked about or we've mentioned um, understanding our identity and we've used the phrase the father heart and understanding God as your father. And, and so we just felt that we really wanted to unpack that a little bit and maybe in doing so share with you our story because each one of us had been Christians a long before that is that, that we, we'd come to know Jesus as our personal savior, but way quite a long time before we actually understood God as our daddy mm. and understood yeah. who what that actually meant mm. that we were so so we want to we want to share our stories with you and Cece why don't you kick us off yeah. tell us your yeah. story you know just the, the whole topic of identity can just seem so vast can't it like well what do you mean of course I know who I am yeah you know my name is you know etc yeah. etc et but really like like who are we and whose are we and in, in my personal journey, just learning about, okay, you are not this person who doesn't belong. You're completely lovable. Mm. You know, you're worthy of pursuit, like you're worthy of all of these things. That was such a foreign concept because I grew up in an environment that was very much performance driven. So for me, it was about if I do this, then sure. I will get this. Sure. If I fast for 40 days, then maybe God will, maybe God will speak to me. Wow. Maybe, perhaps. You know, it was, it was very performance yeah. driven. And just knowing about myself just seemed to be very, very difficult. And that's where all of the behavior, like, you know, we've spoken about in previous episodes mm. about being the promiscuous girl. You know, because I was looking for love. I was looking for mm. my identity in, in the wrong places. Sure. Sorry to sound so cheesy. Along the journey, though, for me, it really came, it really came to, you know what? How long are you going to live in this cycle? How long are you not going to know who you are? Wow. And what does that look like? And, it, and, you know, I speak about my Bethel experience because it was five years of being, okay, God, now we need to speak now. We need to, you need to tell me who I am. Sure. I need to understand because things have been tainted by my past. And I remember having this revelation one day and being encountered by love. Wow. And I remember being laying down in my room and I thought if I did nothing else but stayed in this room until the day that I died, wow. God would still love me. Mm. And my, the love encounter in that moment where I realized I don't have to perform for love. I don't have to do anything mm. or change anything or, you know, it was just about just being authentically me. And I, I, I mean, I don't know about you ladies, but for me, I would walk around with a mask. Mm. I would present myself as one person and people say, oh, you're so amazing. And I'm mm. like, oh, if you really knew, yeah, then yeah. you wouldn't say that. And there was a lot of shame and there was a lot mm. of kind of, you know, you just don't get me. And it was because I wasn't really showing who I am. So for me, my journey was, my journey really looks like becoming more authentic. And out of that, that's when I wrote my book about 21 Insights for Authentic Living. Wow. And it was really about who am I? Can I confront my darkness? Mm. And when I do confront the darkness, am I still lovable? Sure. Because I think that's the part that we it's get huge. really, yeah. it scares us. If you knew this about me, would you still love me? Yeah. You know, if you it's knew these dark, deep parts of me, would I still belong? Mm. And it's in the acceptance. I always talk about self-acceptance and I feel like, when you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, okay, this is who I am, and you accept that, you start to evolve and you start to grow and your identity begins yeah. to form and you realize like, actually, I'm a child of God. I don't have to do anything for anyone. It's just simply, I can just be myself. So I think, I mean, it's just such a long journey and we're constantly evolving, aren't yeah, we? That's right, yeah. I don't yeah. think constantly. we've ever arrived there, do Never, you know? no. never. We're constantly mm. evolving. So for me, it was really just that encounter with God and understanding like, whoa, 
I don't have to do anything for love. Like sure. my value isn't based in what I do or what I can do for other people. My value was when Jesus was on the cross. Mm. When he went to the cross, he said, you are valuable. And that's why I'm giving my life. So for me, it was really, mm. the journey was just incredible because I would hide. That I think for me is, is I can feel myself getting emotional about that. I would hide because I didn't want people to know. Wow. And I think a lot of people do that. You didn't want that. people to know who you were. Yeah, mm. who I thought I was. Sure, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and my experiences and the shame and the, the choices because it was, it was really a judgmental environment. Mm. And it wasn't until I realised, like, oh, my gosh, like I don't have to perform for love. Mm. Like, when you've lived your life having yeah. sex yeah. to feel yeah. love and yeah. then you have that epiphany, I don't yeah. actually have to do this. Yeah. Completely shifting. And, and in that, the strength and my, my, my boldness to actually stand up as I am and be like, this is who I am. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, so you don't. So who did God say that you were? What did you find out? What did he say you yeah, were? Going from good. what you knew yeah. you weren't. Yeah. So for you, what was it he said you were? I think the, the, the hardest thing for me to believe was that I was beautiful. Like that was the hardest. And it yeah. might sound very just, you know, whatever. No, no, no. But, the hardest thing for me was to accept mm. that I was beautiful. I wrote a spoken word piece that came from, God, how could you make me so ugly? Wow. How could you make, I mean, I would cry. I was so depressed. But when he said, you are beautiful and that you are my daughter, mm. you know, there's two, two phrases that the Lord uses with me and it's, there's um, my child and there's my daughter. And I hear that often. And it was a sense of belonging because mm. in the household, although my family, my parents were together, there was an emotional absence. There wasn't that. I never heard I love you growing up. Mm. So I didn't know that I was actually loved. I didn't know that who I was sure, was enough. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I so, do. yeah, I would really, really say that wow. that would be it. That's yeah. amazing, yeah, Cece. Yeah, that would be it. Isn't it, doesn't it change everything? It changes everything because, because you're not trying to find it in, in people or the guy or yeah. because you know who you belong to. Yeah. Like, now this is who I am. I can walk into a room. I don't have to feel insecure about it. I mean, we have our little insecurities. I'm not going to be like, I don't have any insecurities. No, of course. But, but on a whole, it's just like, this is who I am. Like, I am powerful. I am free. I'm able to be who I am. And if somebody doesn't like it, that's your problem. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I know Chris said that. Yeah. You know, recently that was something that you'd learned. This is me. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry. Was it you that said that? I think it was her. I don't think it was me. <laughs> well, anyway, it's the truth, though, you? isn't it? <laughs> wow, Cece, that's a powerful story. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You. What about you? I've just been cherub? thinking. Um, I'd like to start right at the beginning because, um, as you knew from the, the other day, that I was adopted. I, yeah. I understand I was several months old before I was placed and I was in hospital, in the hospital cot. And oh. nurses would just feed me. And looking yeah. back now, I can think, well, that's the time where you come out of yeah. the womb and you, you have people around you mm. yeah. saying loving things mm. over you, even though you can't yes. hear them. So, there's, so I missed probably several months oh. of having an identity as a wanted baby. Mm. Yes. So I think looking back, that oh, had a so major huge impact. Huge impact. Sure. Yeah. Then I was adopted into a family where um, they were old, an older couple they didn't know how to parent and they kind of carried on the same life uh, as they did before. And I, I was kind of looked after myself a lot of the time. In sure. those days, it, social service wouldn't have particularly done anything. So I had to bring myself up. Yeah. Mm. And in doing that, I had to try and make myself a person that fitted mm. those people around yeah. me, fitted yeah. my environment. In that as well, I had um, co co adoptive cousins and uncles and aunts who made it very clear that... I was different. Wow. It, I, I always knew yeah. that I didn't belong because sure. they told me I didn't belong. Mm. That was nice. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. I remember being three years old, this is really weird, three years old, looking at them. Now, you don't rationalise when you're three. No. Looking at them thinking, I don't belong to you and I'm so glad. Oh, really? <laughs> so cute. Because I knew that, that I didn't belong. Mm. So in one sense, that was a freedom for me. I didn't belong to them, so I don't have to be like that. Wow. But then there's a problem. Yes. I don't know then who I need to be like. Yeah. And so I would read, I would read, read, read lots of books about clever girls and Mallory Towers and the heroine, and I'd identify with that person. Sure. And I think I had yeah. to be that person. 
But the problem was I was so screwed up, because you can imagine what I've just oh, described, yeah. Yeah, doesn't terrific. give you good mental health. In fact, sure. I can remember at seven years old uh, just looking at a bus going by and thinking, oh, I think I'll jump in front of that bus. Wow. Because I didn't see, I didn't have any vision, I didn't have any yeah. vision for myself. Yeah. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't, I uh, didn't, because I used to go to Sunday that. school and mm. I used to hear, get the tracts and I'd read about Jesus on these tracts. Mm. And that kept me, I think, looking back, I think that kept me mm. for thinking there is a God and he wants me. Mm. I didn't know why. Yeah. In, the, in the home I was being brought up with, brought up in, I was very naughty. I would, be. I would be, because I was kicking against yeah. rebellion, really. Yeah, of course, of course. And so I was constantly told what was wrong with me, that I was the naughty girl and I ought to do this and I ought to do that. So what did I do? I became what the naughty girl. Told, yeah. That became my identity. So yeah. I told myself, yeah. this is who I am. So yeah. I'm going I'm to fight you, I'm going to take you on, I'm, you know, I'm going to rebel from a very early age. Mm -hmm. and, and then I became a Christian, I became spirit-filled, but underneath... I hadn't yet known God as Father, so yeah. I carried that misconstrued identity of mm. being tough, of being you know, the one that you need yeah. to watch out for, the one that didn't, I didn't have to behave, so I didn't have to achieve anything because I was the bad one. Yes. Wow. Just can't get it wrong, yeah. can you, if you're And so half of my adult life, I was mm. being whatever I decided to be, whatever mm. you wanted to meet me to be one day, yeah. or what would make you not like me, mm. just right. to prove to me that I am the bad girl that nobody wanted to have anything to do with. Wow. Yeah. And then, fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, and then I, had, then I had my breakdown, which was to do with a lot of things, not just to do with that. Yeah. Um, and then I was forced to have nothing but God. Wow. I had wow. to go to the cross. I had this ministry called um, uh, All Saints Woodford Wells with this, this uh, min amazing ministry. I was there for two years. Every week I would go there and they would just let me talk wow. and take stuff to the cross. And I learnt the Father heart actually in this Anglican church wow. in North East London, yeah. where they just loved me and didn't judge me. And I began to, and began to be me. Wow. It was just amazing. But what I realise now is what words we say over people. Yeah. If yeah. we don't know who we are, if we're not confident in who yeah. we are, and let's face it, who is fully confident right. in who they yeah. are? Yeah. Right. What yeah. words are spoken over us, we put on ourselves mm. as identity. Right. So having come out of that, I had a, a dream and a vision, and God told me that he would restore every area of my life. Now, my story the other day was when I was restored to my natural mother, restored to my family yeah. so that's 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 yeah. another story but God said no every area of your life there will wow. be restoration so and, yeah. and that's part of your ministry and my ministry it? now we, we, we I have prophetic ministry I travel separately in that yeah. um, but the ministry that God started was called Restoration House yeah. and we yeah. opened up our, our home and we would have people in and the vision was when people come to your place we might call it church we might call it, it's a place of restoration whether they need emotional physical relational, restoration, financial maybe, that, yes. that, that, was the, that was our calling, that was our anointing because that was my story, that's my husband's yes. story as well. So now we have a church, uh, we have a couple of churches actually that have come out of that uh, and we have a, a meeting once a month in Southampton where anyone can come but really my prayer every month is that people would find restoration when they come. And so you teach on restoration? Oh, yeah, that, teach on restoration. And well, we, we trained in restoring the foundations ministry, so we're ministers there, Fantastic. various other ministry. And I think really now my prophetic ministry has that anointing on it. Wow. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. amazing. Yeah. That is so amazing. Yeah, but the words we speak over one another, words of life, yes. you know, rather than words of death, yeah. are so important. <clears throat> yeah, they are. What we say of people is so important yeah. and we sometimes be so flippant with words mm -hmm. aren't we and yeah it's so important and I I thought that I probably wouldn't share um, about my own story of encountering God as dad and I thought I might just talk about identity in the church because mm -hmm. we have this really big um, idea particular where we've been in church a long time of what a Christian woman might look like mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of them is that they are good at cooking. Well, I fall flat on my face instantly. Yeah, because I cannot. 
I struggled daily to produce anything edible out of the kitchen. And, and I always found that really difficult. Mm. You know, because people would be bringing their homemade stuff, you know, and the night before we just had stew that tastes like braised badger. And and the thing, you know, if the kids are like, Mum, I can't eat this. And I'm like, don't be ridiculous, just eat it. I put a piece in, I go, no, <laughs> we don't have to eat it, we'll go to the tube shop. And, and so you feel like you should mm. be able to sew and able to knit and able to, you know, mm-hmm. crochet a bonnet in you know, an hour's time and 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 I can't do any of those things. Mm. And and I You don't fit. I don't fit. No. So I felt very inadequate. Mm. And and when you know and when my ex husband would say to me, um, you know, oh just run to the you know kitchen and get me that or run to the car and get me this and I'd go, What's the matter with you? Have your legs fallen off? And and it was like but that was not the environment we grew up in. Yeah, so, so in church, but I mean, in my home, that didn't happen. Mm. You know, so we, I felt out of place and I mm. always felt that I never belonged in church. Mm. Well, yeah, me too. Mm. Yeah, and, and if you were loud, yeah. yeah, and if you had a bit of a raucous sense of humour, you just weren't what they were looking for. Sure. And I think that's probably one of the other reasons that I ended up in my first marriage was that I didn't think anybody else would want me. Sure. Mm. Yeah, because I didn't fit and I couldn't mm. do those things that people were supposed mm. to be able to do. Mm. Do you think it's still like that? Or do you think no, it's I not? No, I don't think it's like that. But what I mean, changed for you, Alan? We don't then? crochet bonnets anymore. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Knitting socks. <laughs> For the troops. <laughs> for the troops. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what changed for me was that I suddenly realised that I don't fit. Mm. And, um, and that's I, good, isn't yeah, it? <laughs> because then I stopped trying mm. to fit. And that, and then that helped me. And I, I can't say I don't care what people think, because I think most of us do care what people or think. what a few people think. What a few people think. And I think that's important. But I'm no longer trying... Mm. To, to fit in and be something I'm not mm. in order to fit. I just, mm. graciously as I can, <laughs> we have varying degrees of success in that, um, just be me. Sure. Yeah, and, and I don't volunteer for those things. I'll say to people, I'll do anything, but don't ask me to do the catering. Mm. Don't ask me to be in the kitchen. I can wash it's up. Not your identity. <laughs> I can, I'll wash up. I don't mind washing up. I don't mind clearing up. But don't ask me to try and cook food for, you but know. But don't you think identity mm. is, is who God made us to be inside and finding out who that is? And who that is. And when we know who that God is our daddy, yeah. and God really convicted me that, and he said, you don't really... How do you relate to me as father? Mm. And I was yeah. like, well, you are my father. And he went, but I'm not your daddy. Mm. Mm. And it was like, oh, wow. wow. Yeah. yeah, I was telling Sue about it on our way here. And, and, and when he started to have this conversation with me, it, it was in 2010 and we'd had that really bad winter. Mm. Yeah, and my car windscreen washers had frozen absolutely solid and I had to get from um, West Yorkshire to Liverpool to pick up my daughter down the motorway and I had no wash wipe. So I'd got a bottle of water that was leaning out of the window, mm. squirting. I'm sure, I'm sure if there's I any police that. watching. <laughs> right, okay, but I was doing that, trying to, trying to be able to see, and God's talking to me about all these things. And I'm saying, this is a really inconvenient time. Mm-hmm. This is a really good thing, but I'm absolutely crying my eyes out. I can't see out the window anyway. But I did manage to get to Liverpool and back. Um, and it was like I didn't realise that he wasn't my daddy mm. and that he was just my father. Mm. And he reminded me of some things that had happened in my childhood which had created that. Mm. And we dealt with those things. And, and I think when I realised that, of, of what God was like, I stopped trying yeah. to mm. fit in. But don't you find sometimes we need other people to help us? Yes. You know, I went on the, this this course at this Anglican church that's, yeah. that set yeah. me free. I mean, Sue, you run alive and kicking, and it's just yes. amazing what's happening there. Tell us mm. a bit about that. Yeah, it is. Well, like you, I was I I gave my life to Jesus when I was eight years old, and um, 
And it wasn't till I was in my forties till I got, to, oh gosh, tissues. <laughs> it wasn't till I was in my forties that I realized who he was mm -hmm. and, um, and who I was. You know, I, I, I identify with all of your stories. I didn't fit in. I thought I was worthless. I couldn't imagine anybody loving me unconditionally, yeah. um, apart from my mum, <laughs> who I said about earlier. And, and, and um, I thought I would, I, I, I think it's been said, I, I thought everybody would suddenly realise, you know, wake up and realise who I really was. Right, right. Like, and so it was like trying to keep it all together. But because I'm so loud and, and quite open, it was, it was even harder to keep it all together because it all just kept coming sure. out, you know. Mm. And um, we were leading a church. I mean, and I, you know, and I think we've said, haven't we, about being an orphan. And an orphan just means mm. it, in the Christian circle that you don't know who your dad is and you don't know who you, you were. And it was, it, I was in my 40s when I started this journey and it was definitely the change everything journey for me. Um, I think they, it was funny, the identity and the father heart stuff seemed to go side and <coughs> alongside. Mm -hmm. I, I started having people s say things to me, you know, like prophetically go, Sue, you're a mother to the nation. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. you have no idea who I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm and what I'm a lot of things, but I'm not that. And I, I can remember, I can remember being in Bethel. I think it was the first time we were out there and I was in, in the queue for coffee at Hebrews and somebody came up behind me and they said, oh, I, I saw you in the worship last night and, and, I've got a, and I've, a God gave me a download for you. And it was before I, I, you know, I didn't think to get my phone out. And she started prophesying about who I was and what she saw me to be. And uh, it was mind-blowing. I cannot remember anything about it apart from, again, mothering the nation and, and rising up and taking your place. And she went away. And this is what, you know, we've talked about how do we hear God. I had this conversation going on in my head. God said to me, okay, Sue, now it's your turn to choose. Wow. You can either choose what I say about you or you can continue to wallow in the self-pity that you have over your life. And, wow. and I went... Wow. wow. And even though it was, seemed so ridiculous for me to dare to believe anything good about what could I could be, I thought, well, I knew that was God. So I said, well, I dare, I dare right now to trust you. And then, and then another time we had um, who, somebody that's now a really good friend of mine, but at the time I didn't know who, Madam Mark Stibby came mm -hmm. and did a conference and he introduced me to the Father God. Oh. He introduced me to this lavish dad who who just wants to sit me on his lap and tell me I'm beautiful and I'm worthy and I'm mm. good enough. In fact, I'm better than good enough. I'm treasured and I'm... And, and because I'd had that experience, it was like, all right, I'm going to dare to believe that that might be who you are. Mm. I've lived 40 years believing you're somebody completely different. But what if... What if I dared to believe you're who you say you are, you know? And um... I've known you for 40 years and you are not the same person that you were. This is not just talk. You are completely different. Yeah. And you, you are transformed and it's so... You just, just this massive work of grace. I don't mean you're massive. Just wanted to be very <laughs> clear about that. The the grace that's mm. over your life is so amazing. It really did change everything, and it changed my marriage. Mm. It changed my children. It changed the church. We, were, I mean, my our poor church, our poor church, having a raving, a raging orphan leading them. You know, I would love to tell you what I used to introduce myself as, but. The producer has told me I'm not allowed to, but but it's I used to who you are. It's because it's not who I am now. But but I so believed I would want. Mm. I'm going to tell you how rubbish I am before you find out from yourself. But mm. the thing is, so so God took me on this transfer. I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, this would have just been. This wouldn't even been a figment of my imagination wow. doing this wow. because I wouldn't be worthy of doing it. And um, so, yeah, so, so I'd been on this amazing journey and then God, God hijacked me literally and told me that he wanted me to do something for women. I'm like, no, 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 we don't do women's <laughs> stuff in our church, babes. This is not right. Yeah. And, um, and basically I, I ignored him for six months and then I got to the stage where I couldn't ignore him anymore. And he gave me the name. He said, it's a light, I want you to call it 
alive and kicking. Mm. And I want you to take women on the journey that I've taken you on wow. into wow. freedom and taking the mask off mm. and vulnerability and living shame free. Right. And, yeah. and that's what I do. So yeah. it's a three day school of We've empowerment on, for women. Yes, yeah, so th th these women are changed because of that. Absolutely. I'm I was a right mess before I went on there. <laughs> so, I really but, enjoyed it. Thank you. I love doing it. I yes. cry a lot. <laughs> I cry a lot and, and, and I just tell my story. And you take and, us through different stages, yeah, don't you? Just the whole so the stage. Mm. And, and and I tell my story and then Holy Spirit, you know, most the, the work is really done by Holy Spirit and it's life changing. Wow. And um, but, you know, um, all the details of Restoration House and of Cece, what was your book called? 21 Insights for Authentic Living. Wow, I love that. Mm. And Alive and Kicking and, and, and Alison's stuff. Topsy and Tim go to the supermarket. <laughs> she, she, she wrote yes. that in her spare time. So all those, um, the details will be on the screen. But um, we want you to just, we're just going to take a quick break and we're really excited because we've got an amazing guest with us. We've got a man. Woo -woo, we haven't had enough men on this programme, I think. Uh, Matthew Porter will be man. joining us. Yeah, very brave man. He has no idea what he's in for. But come back after the break and see. <laughs> Welcome to The Mum Show. I think it's just so important for children to feel safe, so they have to have some boundaries in place. You know, anybody can be the pastor at the church, anybody could lead that meeting, anybody could run that team, nobody else can be the parent to my children. It was a real releasing yes. moment yeah. for me to just say, do you know yeah. what, I, the, I can take this so far, but God's got the rest. And I want to be an actress when I grow up happy. Talk to people and like to cheer people up. And crazy. <laughs> you know, our own experiences of being parented has a huge impact on how we, how we feel loved and also how we then go on and make meaningful relationships. And the word is just full of, like, guidelines for right living. Hello and welcome back to Let's Get Real. So, we have the brave man that dared to come and sit at our kitchen table. Welcome, Reverend, I do want to give you your full title, <laughs> Reverend Matthew Porter. Thank you so thank much you. for being brave enough to join us around the table. Thank you. It's great to be on the show. <laughs> uh, tell us a bit about your journey and how you ended up in that wonderful place. Yeah. So, I live in, in York, um, the old historic capital of the north. We still like to think yes. that's the case. Yes. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm a, a vicar, a senior leader of a church called the Belfry, St. Michael of Belfry, which is right in the heart of York, right next to York Minster, wow. which is probably the finest Gothic uh, cathedral in Northern Europe. Wow. Wow. And uh, so it's a great privilege to live in the, in the city of York. I'm married to Sam. We've been married for 27 years. Wow. We've got good. five sons. Good from, uh, wow. 13 to 23. And we've also got a, a teenager asylum seeker. Uh, refugee living with wow. us as well. So it's a amazing. busy household. Busy wow. household. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. Now, one of my heroes is Archbishop Centenou. Yeah. And I just remember when he first came, he was baptising yeah. in a paddling pool on yeah. the steps of the yeah, cathedral. Yeah, we, we, we often help him do that. Do you? Yeah, he do does you? that uh, uh, around about uh, Pentecost yeah. every really? year. Yeah. yeah, he's quite a character, isn't he? Oh, he's, 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 he's a great character. He's, he's a wonderful leader. Um, he's a really, one of his main gifts is actually evangelism, right. just telling people about Jesus. And it's great to see him on the streets, just talking to people and wanting people to hear the good news of Jesus. And often he leads people to Christ on the streets. Wow. Really? Yeah, that's wow. one of his main gifts wow. to the church. Yeah. yeah, so he doesn't just sit in his... Not at all. No, no. Bishop cubby hole in the cathedral. No, he loves to be out and about amongst the people. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. And you've just written a book. I have indeed, and I've got copies with me. Ooh, I've got a copy you. for Ooh. each of you. Ooh, so thank you. Excellent. Wow. So you, you enjoy, enjoy this. Yeah, this um, I wrote this book much. actually last year. It's oh. called... Um, and it's got a bookmark. There you are, especially <laughs> for you. <laughs> it's called The A to Z of Discipleship. And um, I, I wrote this book really, um, well, for a number of reasons, but the main one is to help new believers. Mm. So at the Belfry, where right. I'm the vicar, uh, we regularly have people... Um, begin this journey of following Jesus. Wow. In fact, most, most weeks and sometimes more, more than one a week, you know, so often, wow. and often they're young people, 
and often with no church background at all. Sure. And uh, so they, they know nothing, which is actually quite a good place. So, so yes. what, what do you give them? It was actually hard to know. What do you give someone who knows okay. nothing? They're just starting the journey. Sure. So really, this is for those kind of people. So or perhaps as someone who's thinking about starting following Jesus, but wants to know what does that mean? Sure. Um, yeah. Or maybe people want to go back to basics. So it's a very simple book. Mm. Um, wow. That's what this book's about. That's wow. so good. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm. Actually, the inspiration came in in a dream. Okay. So one of the main ways the Lord speaks to me is uh, prophetically is in dreams. Okay. In fact, I remember it very clearly. It was the 3rd of March, 2013. I remember it because it's, it's my third son Luke's uh, birthday. Wow. I remember waking up that morning having one of these dreams that really grabs your attention. You know, this has come a bit left field. And, um, and in this dream, um, I was handling a book, which I knew I'd written. And oh, I could yeah. see the book. Uh, it had, I saw it had 26 chapters. I didn't see the chapter titles, but I knew the feel. Each chapter was short, mm. uh, with simple language, um, explaining the basics of the faith. And as I looked at it, I saw the title. It was called The A to Z of Discipleship. Oh my goodness. So I remember writing this all down and having a real sense that one day I need to write this book. Well, and uh, I well. wrote it uh, a couple of years ago. We got published last year. Well, thank awesome. you for writing yeah. it because I yeah. do think, you know, I do think that the, there's many tools as you have to help people in their early life and to help people discipleship other people. So yeah. really appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Thank and thank you. you for our copy. I okay. had a very similar experience with Topsy and Tim goes to the supermarket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about discipleship because yeah. we read about Jesus' disciples yeah. and we all know or have an idea of what that looks like and it was people wearing Jesus sandals <laughs> and long really? robes, uh, yeah. a beard um, and feet covered in donkey poo. So apart from the donkey poo, that's just about me because I forgot to get waxed before I came on. Oh, um, that's really too much information. I'm sorry. Just back out a bit. Not too close. Um, so what is a disciple and how do people become one? What do you mean by that? Because it's quite an old-fashioned word. Well, yeah, it is, in, though in some ways I think it's, it's a word that's coming back into right. the church mm, yeah. because actually sometimes we just use the word Christian and I'm very happy to be a Christian mm -hmm. yeah. but actually when you say to somebody I'm a Christian for, for many people particularly who are unchurched that's a very negative word they mm -hmm. think of they think of the institution sometimes sure. they think yes. of oppression yeah. sometimes they think of the crusades yeah. so yes. if you go to my Facebook profile for instance it says religion follower of Jesus mm. oh, and uh, for me that's really at the heart of what it is to be a disciple it's it's literally a follower of Jesus yeah. so go back to, as you said to the first century what were these people doing these disciples, they were literally following Jesus. Yeah. And, and I don't just mean that as a Christian, they, they actually went with they Jesus. Yeah, went, yeah, went he was he the went. master, yeah. so they went where he went, they did what he did, mm. they said what he said. Mm. Yeah. And so it's the same for us, disciples, I think are called on exactly the same journey. And I think it's an exciting journey. You know, yeah. I, think, yes. I think often the church has made discipleship dull and boring. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Bible and, you know, study. Yeah, yeah. God forbid yeah. That, that that's the case. You know, it's, it's an adventure. Mm. I mean, it's Bear right. Grylls talks about that, doesn't he? Yeah, you know, he's the face of, the, of Alpha. And often he says, um, I've heard him say this before, you know, he's had so many adventures in life, but the greatest adventure mm. is following mm. Jesus. Wow. Well, if he says that, that gets my attention. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's you know. true. Like, that yeah. really, really true. And as long as you don't have to eat a still warm yak's liver, yeah, that's true. Yeah, then yeah. that's okay with me. Yeah. 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 So, so for me, uh, disciple, being a disciple is following Jesus. Discipleship mm. is, the definition I give in the book is, is a simple one. I think it's the daily practice of following Jesus. So it is following Jesus, that's important to it, but it's a daily thing, yeah. not something we just do every now and then. Sure. It's a 24-7 sure. thing. Sure. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a lifetime thing. Um, and it's, it involves practice. It involves uh, discipline. It involves sure. work. It involves going sure. on this way of Jesus. It's, it involves yeah. learning. In fact, you know, what, sometimes people uh, might um, translate the word disciple in the Bible as apprentice. I think it's a really good word. Yeah. Oh, really you know, we're learning, we're learning to, uh, uh, yeah. under the, the great master. Wow. I love that. And so why do you think discipleship is so important? Well, I think it's important because it's important to Jesus. Uh, Jesus didn't just, just give great teaching. He gathered followers. He mm. gathered disciples. Mm. So it was important mm. to Jesus. And the very last thing, Jesus said before he, he went to heaven, Matthew 28, is go and make disciples. Mm, he, didn't, he didn't say, yeah. you know, go and um, 
you know, start an alpha course, good as though that is, or go, go to the front and raise your hand or something. Yeah. Or he didn't even say go and plant churches. All those things were important. But what yeah. he actually said was yes. to his disciples, go and make more disciples. So if it was important to Jesus, of course. Yeah. it should be important yeah. to us. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it, it's disciples, isn't it, who change the world, yeah. should be. And hopefully discipleship is not just a good life, it's, it's, the, it's the best life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can think of um, you know, a story that I sometimes tell that, that really shaped me was um, my father before he, he died, um, he, he was a doctor and he retired about 15 years ago. Um, and he lived another five years. Um, and just after he retired, he was sitting in the back of his church one day, uh, a little church in, in Doncaster in South Yorkshire. And as he was sitting there, um, an Iranian asylum seeker came in and sat next to him in, in, in church in the pew. And they got chatting and he, he quite liked it. He said, can I come back next week? And he said, oh, well, I'm sure you can. Can I bring a friend? I'm sure you can. So he came back a few times with his friends and my father led him to Christ. Wow. Um, and then the friend and then another one and then mm. another one. And they started to grow this little Iranian community wow. of believers. And, and when they got to about 30, the pastor of the church said to my father, there's too many of these folk. Can you help look after them? So wow. he said, sure. So for the next five years, wow. I, him and my mother, they, they looked after this oh, community wow. and they baptized, I think, 120. Wow. Um, wow. So a little revival going on there. It was a wonderful wow. thing. But I remember my dad coming to me after about nine months into this. He said, one of these Iranian new Christians has really challenged me. I said, well, how did he challenge you? He said, well, he came to me and he said, Richard, um, can you help me? He said, well, if I can, I, I will. And he said, will you show me and teach me how to live? Mm. Wow. And he said, how to live what? He said, how to live so life wow. as a Jesus follower. Because I'm, I used to be a Muslim, now I'm Christian. And mm. I want to know how do I love my wife? Yeah. How, do, how do I raise my children? What do I do with my, my money? Oh, wow. How, and my dad said to me, I knew I got my work cut out then. <laughs> but that's discipleship, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's the best yeah. way to live. And we yeah. need to train people, help mm. ourselves and each other to know what does it mean to follow yeah, Jesus, sure. live this life that's good for us mm. and transforms the world. Yeah. That's what discipleship is about. And do you think about. that's why we've lost quite a lot of people, converts, who turned to Jesus but then have slipped away? Do you think it's because we, we haven't discipled them properly? Mm. Well, that's probably... Probably part of it, isn't it? Yeah, and and uh, you, you know, we, it's a journey for us all. We're not, we're not, none of us are perfect, are we? No, but we no. need mm. to create a community in our churches and a culture in our churches that encourages discipleship. Mm. That's really important mm. to us at the Belfry. We, sure. we, we, yeah. we we don't do this perfectly, but we're learning how to do this mm. better. And then how how do we how do we mature as mm. disciples? Like, because you know, you've got the new convert, and then they're you know they're growing, yeah. they're, they're learning the basic principles, yeah. but. How do we mature? Because even, you know, we've been, I mean, I've been saved for many years now mm -hmm. and I'm sure there's the next level of maturity. So how would mm -hmm. we practically do that? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I, I think it's about not making it too complicated, actually. I think mm -hmm. it's about doing the basics well. Um, oh, and I, I'm a, quite a lover of rugby. We're in the um, season well, of the, uh, the, the Six Nations <laughs> at the minute. And uh, I, was, I read a quote in the paper a couple of weeks ago from Eddie Jones, who's the England rugby coach. And this, this quote really got my attention because I was asking him, you know, what makes a, what makes a, a, a world-changing team? Mm. And uh, I, I read this quote in the paper and he basically said, you know, to, to be that good, it's not about doing brilliant things. Mm. It's about doing basic things brilliantly. Yeah. And I, I love that. I thought, yes. And I thought, actually, discipleship is about that. You know, we could overcomplicate it, but yeah. actually it's doing the basic things. So what does that mean for us personally? Reading the Bible. Every day, mm. just be daily in the word. Um, be praying every day. Mm. Be prayerful as we go through life. You know, f following the, the two commandments, love God with everything we've got mm. and, and love our neighbours. Mm. Yes. Um, you know, care for the poor, reach out with his love. These things actually aren't difficult. Mm. It's just doing the basic things well, I think. Mm. And then encouraging each other in this because mm. we struggle sometimes, sure, don't we? Sure, and we find sure. it difficult yeah, and sure. we need someone to put an arm around our shoulder sometimes and support us. So. Um, so that's, I think that's how we that's how we mature. Mm. Just do the basic stuff well. And would you say is so? Would you say as well, like maybe having somebody, <clears throat> excuse me, who you could be accountable to? Yeah. I think accountability comes kind of comes into yeah. this. Very like, much so. You know what? This is 
Because accountability isn't, oh, I've done something wrong, tell me off when, when you've seen that I've done something yeah. wrong. It's like, well, this is who I say I want to be because you help me become that yeah. Yeah. or hold up the standard yeah. for me to be that. Yeah. Mm. So would you say that accountability would be a really important part Cru of... Crucial, yeah. yeah. And, and, you, yeah. and if you look at Jesus, I mean, he spent time with the, a crowd, 72, mm. but then with the 12, he had the team, then he had the three, mm. yeah. and even just one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I often wonder, what, what did the three get up to? We, we get glimpses of it in the Gospels, yeah, we, don't we? But yeah. it seems like he took them aside, kind of mentored them. Mm -hmm. So different size, sizes, I think, really help. So I'm, I'm, I'm part of a small group mm -hmm. in, in, our, in our church, but I'm also part of a three. And for me personally, I've been in a, a particular prayer triplet with, with two guys now for 20, 20 plus years. Wow. And we just hang out together. We email each other. We, we text mm -hmm. each other. We get together and we pray for each other. We, uh, we confess our sins to each other. It's really healthy. It's really wow. good. That's so that accountability cool. is crucial, I think. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And is that what you would, is that in a way, what you've, or what you've said, would that be like a culture of it, discipleship it, it, that you've explained? Yeah, definitely. It, 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 it would be. And, and different levels for different things. And um, I think we see something of like that culture in the scriptures at the end of Acts chapter 2. So in Acts chapter 2, we have the outpouring of the Spirit. Um, and, and but Pentecost and 3,000 become believers. It's, it's a wonderful first day of the church. But then there's that lovely description, isn't it, at the end of Acts chapter 2 of, mm -hmm. of what that community was like. It talks about how they were generous and how they were praying and mm -hmm. the same miracles. Yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. But it also talks about how they were in the temple with a larger group and then how they gathered in homes and yeah. in smaller mm -hmm. groups. And they were yeah. obviously, obviously doing different things mm -hmm. in those different places and different levels of accountability. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's that lovely scripture at the end, the Lord added daily to their number, mm -hmm. yeah. those yes. being saved. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the number of disciples was growing. They were expecting uh, to be making disciples all the time. And well, I think uh, what's that, interesting about that is, is I heard someone say once, they were all together in one place, yeah. and then the Holy Spirit fell. Mm -hmm. But it was the culture of unity. It was the choosing to be yeah. together. And then the mm -hmm. Spirit came. I think we often think, you know, Holy Spirit come and then we'll be one. Yeah. Right. But it's that right. discipline of saying, you know, we're together, we're exactly. one. Mm -hmm. and, and choosing yeah. discipleship yeah. and the Holy Spirit yeah. Yeah. comes upon that. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And, 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 and that place of prayer as well, isn't it? Yeah. They, were, they were gathering they were to pray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Wow. wow. Matthew, thank you so much for being with us. Mm. The A to Z of discipleship. I really think this is going to be such an excellent yeah. tool for the church Absolutely. and for new Christians. And thank you for writing it. Not and at all. thank you for having the courage <laughs> to come on our program and talk about it. We really appreciate it. It's been fantastic it. to be here. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you so thank you. much for joining us and join us next time for Let's Get Real. Bye.